Let's, uh, let's open our Bibles, okay? We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're into the second part of this particular teaching. It's called the problem of immorality. You remember that the Corinthian church was a church that had many problems. Um, we looked in chapters 1 and 2 at the problem of disunity. We looked at chapters 3 and 4 at the problem of immorality. Or sorry, immaturity. And then now chapters 5 and 6 at the problem of immorality. The outline for today, if you're taking notes, you jot these down. Number one is lawsuits in verses 1 to 11. And number two is loose living in verses 12 to 20. So we've got lawsuits and loose living. Heavenly Father, we pray now as we open up this portion of Scripture. Uh, Lord, these are deep issues that we're dealing with, issues of immorality amongst Christians. We're dealing with particularly issues of lawsuits and sexual immorality. And these hit very close to home, Lord. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to have open hearts and open minds to hear what you have to say. Help us to be willing to be corrected, to repent if need be, and to do things your way. You are the creator. You're the designer of our lives. You know how best to fix us and make us operate and live to the fullest, to the max. So Lord, if there's anything lacking in us, oh Lord, search our hearts. Try us. Know our anxieties. See if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look in verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous? And not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. The issue that they were dealing with in this chapter is that they were having lawsuits against one another within the church, but they were bringing them into secular courts. They were suing one another in secular courts. And Paul, in verse 1, notice, he says, dare any of you. In other words, he's saying, how dare you do this? In other words, I can't believe that you're actually suing one another in secular courts before, he says, the unrighteous. Unrighteous meaning those who are not believers. You're airing out the dirty laundry of the church in a public arena and you're ruining your witness. You're blowing it. You're bringing the cause of Christ down. You're bringing the reputation of the church down in the eyes of all the people in the community. And so he says, how dare you do that? And Paul speaks very plainly to them. In those courts in Corinth and in any Greek city, They would have them in the marketplace, in the agora. So they were very public, these courts. And then, as today, they liked a good court case. You know, I was thinking of some of the more recent, very public court cases that have been uh, televised. Oscar Pistorius, the Blade Runner. You remember South Africa? Well, the judge allowed that to be televised, and we were all kind of glued, wondering what was going to happen with this guy. Or Anders Breivik in, in Norway, who killed all those children and bombed uh, the city. And then you remember in the States, a number of years ago, there was that O.J. Simpson trial that was just huge, and it was televised. 
And everybody was sort of glued to it. And it was being played out in the public arena. Well, they loved a, a, a good trial publicly. And so here the church is now bringing their disagreements out into the public arena. And everybody's sort of watching. And it's just blowing the witness of the church. What are the marks of Christianity? The marks of Christian brotherhood? Well, Jesus said, I want you to love one another even as I have loved you. By this, by love, all will know that you follow me by the love that you have for one another. Love and unity is the mark of Christian brotherhood. So what marks us in our lives for one another to the world is that we love one another and that we're unified. And so what they were doing is they were, they were bringing all these disagreements out in public and, and the, the church was just being brought down and the people were saying, that's love? That's Christianity? I don't want to have anything to do with that. And so he says, how dare you? Notice what he says. He says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. He's saying, this matter should be taken care of within the context of the church. He goes on to say, why? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now when he talks about saints, I have to bring this up over and over again. We, we read the word saint in the Bible and some of us immediately think of somebody that has a halo on their head who's done certain miracles and has been canonized by the Roman Catholic Church. Well, that's not what a saint is according to the Bible. The Bible says that any Christian, any Christian is a saint. It's a set-apart one. You're set apart for God. So if you're a Christian, you're a saint. If you're not a Christian, you're an ain't. And that's just the way it is. It's black or white. You're either a saint or you're not a saint. He says, you need to bring these uh, before the saints. And he says, the, the saints are going to judge the world. Now, Jesus said this in Revelation 2.26. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. So in the millennial kingdom, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign for a thousand years... Those of us who are Christians will rule and reign with him. Co-ruling will be judging the world at that time. Okay? Now, it's not like we're the Supreme Court judges. No, Jesus is the Supreme Court judge. And we're sort of the judges underneath that. A good example of this was in Exodus chapter 18 when Moses was judging the people and he was so busy judging the people he didn't have time to be with his family or even to eat. So his father-in-law says, well, why don't you choose some people, delegate the responsibility of judging and they'll bring you the hard cases. So he appointed people over thousands and over hundreds and they brought the hard cases to Moses. But they judged all the small matters. So we're kind of like those who have been delegated judgment during the millennial reign. Okay, so that's what it means. We're going to be judging the world. But did you also notice what it says? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Now this is just amazing to me. These beings that are so much more powerful and mighty than we are and who are in the very presence of God all the time. He says, you are going to judge them. That's just incredible. Now it tells us in Jude 6, the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. I think that when we judge angels, this is talking about actually fallen angels, not, not the good ones, but the fallen angels. You know, when, when Satan rebelled, he took one-third of the demons with him, it tells us in Revelation uh, 12. And so we're going to stand in judgment over those demons. And I think this is what is going to happen at that judgment. 
we're going to say to them, how could you? You who were in the very presence of God, you who saw him in all his glory, how could you rebel against him? I mean, here we are on earth. We don't see God except through the eyes of faith. But you were in the presence of God and you rebelled against him. How dare you? I think that may be the judgment. I'm not sure, but it certainly seems that way. How could you do that? The point is this. If we're going to judge the world and if we're going to judge angels, we're judging those great things. Can't the church judge the little things that come our way? In other words, Paul's just saying to the Corinthians, come on, you can do this. You can judge these small matters within your church. You don't have to bring it to a secular court. Verse 4 says, If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? Notice what he says. Those secular judges, he says, are the least esteemed by the church to judge matters within the church. Why is that? Well, I think it's because those who are not believers do not understand the law of Christ. They might understand the laws of the land really well, but the law of Christ is love. We receive the law of Christ into our hearts by the Holy Spirit the moment we become born again. And we understand, oh, Jesus loves me. He laid down his life for me. And now I need to lay down my life for my brother and sister. I need to forgive them. I need to love them, even as Christ loved me. That's the law of love. And we get an understanding of that when we're born again. But an unbeliever does not understand that. And so they're least esteemed to judge. Look in chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. He says the natural man, the unbeliever, can't understand the things that you understand as a Christian. The law of Christ, the law of love. It just, it's, it's impossible for them to really get it. So, you may be a barrister, have a law degree, but when it comes to how Christian brothers should treat each other in love, you just don't get it. And so this is what he's saying. Verse 5, I say this to your shame... Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. He's saying, I'm writing this to shame you. He says, is there not even one wise man among you who can make a judgment here? The Corinthians, you remember, they really were prideful of their knowledge. They thought, Well, we're very, very wise. We can understand so much. We come short in no spiritual gift. We have wisdom. But he says, wait a minute. You don't even have a wise man among you who can judge between two brothers when they have a dispute? He says, this needs to be settled in-house. Now, how is this done in a church? Well, if there's a problem between a brother and sister, a brother and brother, a sister and sister then it should be brought before perhaps the elders who can decide on this or between a wise brother or a wise sister in the church who can act as a mediator or they they even have in this country they even have Christian arbitration it's non-profit free they just they'll allow you to come in you sit down and you say okay I'm going to abide by the ruling of this arbitrator And the other person says, I'll abide by this ruling too. It stays out of secular courts. And it's just a way of maintaining the purity and the reputation of the church in the eyes of the world. And so it can be done. Now, in saying all of this, that these matters should be taken care of within the church, he's not saying 
that it, it, this is criminal law by any means. Criminal law where, where it's a, you know, something very serious, that is a matter for the state to take care of. Romans chapter 13 says that God has established human governments for the restraining of evil and for the rewarding of those who do good. So that becomes a matter for the state to take care of. But in these civil matters, just sort of petty disagreements among Christians, it's got to be taken care of in-house. He's also not saying that Christians can't take unbelievers to a secular court. Because an unbeliever is not going to abide by any kind of a church decision. Uh, The only authority that they're going to recognize is a secular court. In fact, the Paul the Apostle did this very thing. He was before Festus. He had been in prison for two years. He was not getting justice. And Festus comes to him and says, are you willing to go back to Jerusalem to have your matter heard by a court there? And he knew that he wasn't going to get justice in Jerusalem. And he said, I appeal to Caesar. He said, well, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. And he made his way all the way to Rome and he stood before Caesar and Caesar heard his case. He appealed to a secular court because unbelievers were coming against him. Also, I think that um, in saying this, that uh, you know, it's possible to take an unbeliever to a secular court, we do live in an age where people are kind of sue-happy. They're just willing to sue somebody at the snap of the fingers. I'm going to take you to court, I'm going to sue you. And a Christian shouldn't be sue-happy. You know, it says in in Romans 12 that as much as depends on us, we should live peaceably with all men. We must do everything possible we can to settle things out of court and not just to go suing people all the time. But if it comes to that and if it's necessary, this doesn't prohibit that. Look in verse 7. It says, Now therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Paul is saying here to this church and to the people that are going to the secular courts, you think you've got a case that you can win by going to secular court? He says, the fact that you're even going there means that you've already lost. It is a complete failure for you. You're dragging down the reputation of Christ and the church in the eyes of unbeliever, and that is a failure. You know, the world is watching us. The world is watching you. The moment that you go to work or in your neighborhood and you get your Christian flag up and people know that you're a Christian, they're watching you. And they're watching you to see if what you believe is real. If if it's really working in your life. Do you really love your brothers and sisters? Do you really believe in the reputation of Christ and who he is and the church? Are you really walking it out? The world was watching the Corinthians. The world is watching us. And notice what Paul says. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Simply for the sake of Christ in the church, why not just accept it? I find this to be very difficult. I'm sure you do too. Because it goes against my very sin nature. When somebody slaps you on one cheek, what's your immediate reaction? Man, I'm going to punch you. Right? I'm I'm going to get you back so bad. Right? That's what we think. I heard a a story the other day about a little boy um, who was with his two-year-old sister in a room. And the the mother heard crying. Ah, ah." The little two-year-old was, was, uh, or the little boy was crying. And um, she goes in and says, what's happened? Well, the two-year-old had grabbed his hair. And he says, "She, she grabbed my hair. And so the mother said, well, you know, she doesn't know that it hurts. You know, you've got to just forgive her. And so everything was fine. A few minutes later, she hears crying, ah, the two-year-old screaming. 
And she goes back and says, what's happened? And the boy says, now she knows how bad it hurts. Isn't that the way we are, though? We just, we want to get people back. And he says, well, why not just rather let yourselves be cheated for the sake of Christ? Man, I think, how much do I really want God's reputation to, to be um, out there in the world through my life? How much do I really care about that? Matthew 5.38 You've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now bear in mind that was the law of the Jews. And what that law um, prescripted for their nation was it was limiting revenge. Okay, it wasn't saying you have to do this but it limited it. You can't go beyond that. So when somebody slaps you on the cheek, you can't punch them. Jesus said this, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, now he starts, instead of saying, this is the national law, now I'm telling you personally, this is for you personally, don't resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. So he takes that national law and he says, you've heard this said, but I'm telling you personally, I want you to go beyond that. I want you to have mercy. I want you to have forgiveness. I want you to turn the other cheek. Don't resist an evil person. Some things you have to let God sort out on the day of judgment. Some things you're just not going to get justice for in this lifetime. And you just have to say, okay, God... I'm going to let you sort that out and I'm going to move on. And I guarantee you, if you put Christ first in those situations, God will provide for you. If it's a matter of losing money, God will take care of you. Losing your reputation, God will raise up your reputation in his own time. Matthew 6.33 says, If we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the things that we need will be taken care of. Putting God as the highest priority and God will take care of our needs. I remember one of my, um, one of my friends, this man that actually discipled me for a number of years when I was a young believer. Um, he was a Christian businessman in my hometown. And he had lent some money to... Uh, some people and one of the guys um, did not pay him back it was a Christian in his church and it was a difficulty because it was quite a sum and this guy just didn't pay him back and he had to come to this verse and say okay Lord I'm going to give it all to you and God took care of him he didn't ask for it back he didn't make the guy suffer at, in a secular court he just forgave the debt forgive us our debts as we forgive those who Sin against us, the Lord's Prayer says. Another friend of mine, he had a Christian um, do some work for him at his house. And he paid him this money, and the guy did a really shabby job and, and needed to come back and fix the work, but he didn't. And so he had to come to this verse and say, okay, I just... Actually, what he tried to do, first of all, was go to the, the, the church and bring this case before the church. But the other person, the man who did the work, was unwilling. And so he just had to forgive the debt. Our Lord Jesus Christ went through the same thing. They spit in his face. They slapped him. They beat him. They scourged him. And then on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He turned the other cheek. He forgave the debt. And he forgives us our debt too. And so this is what he's calling us to do. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, 
but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Have you noticed this phrase coming up, do you not know? In this chapter, six times he's going to use that phrase, do you not know? They prided themselves on their knowledge and wisdom and and he's saying, you don't even, even understand these things. Don't you understand that the unrighteous, unbelievers, will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he goes on to list certain sins. Now, in the Greek tense, this speaks of a lifestyle, a characteristic of these sins that marks a person's life. They've never ever repented of these things. It's just what they do naturally over and over again. This is not speaking of a Christian who has a temporary struggle, a temporary stumble, a temporary failure. But this is a lifestyle that is unrepentant. He says, neither fornicators, that is, people who sleep around, who have sex outside the bonds of biblical marriage, or idolaters, that's somebody who puts anything or anyone before God, that can be money, can be pleasure, can be a car, can be jobs, a person, or even themselves. Or idolaters, this is a married man or woman who is cheating on his or her spouse. Or homosexuals, and this particular word refers to prostitutes who submit to homosexual acts. Or sodomites, this is a general word for homosexuals, anyone engaging in homosexual acts as a lifestyle. Thieves and covetous. Of course, thieves, those who are thieves and those who are covetous are both greedy. One wants what you've got, the other takes what you've got. Drunkards. You know, it's a sin to be drunk. It's not a sin to have a glass of wine or beer, but it is a sin to be drunk. And these uh, are those who have that lifestyle of, of heavy drinking. Revilers. These are people who are verbally abusive toward other people. And extortioners. These are people who threaten others to get money. Mobsters or gangsters. And I want you to notice what he says about this. He says in verse 9, Do not be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you in, in regard to these things. If your life is characterized by these things... By these sins, and these are just representative sins of all kinds of sins. He says, if if your life is characterized by these sins, you're not going to heaven. You have never, ever become a Christian, is what he's saying. 1 John 1.6 If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 1 John 2.4 He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. There are many people who say, yeah, I became a Christian a long time ago. You know, I I prayed a prayer, I became a Christian, and their life has never, ever changed. They've never repented, they've never turned. The Bible here says, those who claim to know God, those who claim to have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, or don't obey his commandments, they're liars. They do not know God. Repentance is essential to the Christian life. Both John the Baptist and Jesus preached it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Paul, in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, to the Athenians, said, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men men everywhere to repent. This is a command that God has given to us. If we're going to walk with Him, we need to repent. What does it mean to repent? Repentance means to turn around. So if we're going that way in life and we repent, it means we do a 180 and we turn around and we start walking with God. We follow God. We follow His commandments. The Bible says in Amos 3.3, How can two walk together unless they are agreed? If God's going that way and I'm going that way, I'm not walking with God. And so if your life is not changed, then you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. He came to save us from our sins, not to save us in our sins. 
we must repent. And repentance is a choice that you have to make. God will help you repent, but you have to choose this day whom you will serve, whether you're going to serve God or whether you're going to serve sin. Now, when Jesus saves us, you know what he does? He saves us three ways. He saves us from the penalty of sin, he saves us from the power of sin, and he saves us from the presence of sin. He saves us from the penalty of sin, so now there's no more condemnation. All the guilt, all the shame, and everything has been taken away from us because Jesus died for the penalty of our sins on the cross. He also saves us from the power of sin. This is what we refer to as sanctification. Every day, God is saving you from the sins that you once did, and he's making you more like Jesus. Every day, he's breaking that power in your life. As you read the Bible, as you obey the scriptures, as the Spirit of God is prompting you and empowering you to live the Christian life, he breaks the power of sin. And then eventually, he will save us from the penalty of sin. Sorry, from the the presence of sin. He's already saved us from the penalty of sin. But from the presence of sin, when we go to heaven, there's going to be no more sin in heaven. And so from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin, and we are in that second part right now, and that is a process. And he's saving us. Now, if you have failed, if you have failed in any of these areas that we've looked at, in sin, if you're struggling in sin, maybe even if you've gone backwards and you're ashamed of just backsliding and going back to your old lifestyle, I want you to know something, that God understands and God is here to help you and God is here to forgive you and to take you right where you are right now and to forgive you and cleanse you and move you on. He'll do that in your life. What you need to do is simply to be honest with God, confess it, turn from it, and ask God to help you. Ask a brother and sister in the church to pray for you. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's saying that to Christians. Confession, open. Say, Lord, I am struggling here. I've gone backwards, help me. And God will help you. Don't leave this place today before you do that. But I want you to notice this beautiful verse. Verse 11, it says, and such were some of you. This list of sins, he says, that's who you were. That's the past. You're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. He says, don't live your old life. Leave that old life. Live differently now that you're a Christian. Regarding lawsuits, be different. Regarding sexual purity, be different. But you were washed. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You were sanctified. You're set apart for God's purposes. And you have been made justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. To be justified is an actually, actually a legal declaration that God pronounces over your life. He's the judge. He slams the gavel down and he says, you're justified. Before anyone, before me, before the courts of heaven, you're justified. You're declared righteous. And it means more than just as if I'd never sinned. It means that God has actually placed the life of Christ and his righteousness on your behalf. So when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. He sees you as if you had lived that life. That's astounding. Because we know ourselves, God knows ourselves, and he says, I'm still going to do that for you. I'm going to put you in the righteousness of Christ. You're justified. The point that he's making here to the Corinthian church is simply this. You're God's children now. So... You're different than unbelievers. Now act like it. Don't act like the rest of the world. Don't bring the reputation of Christ and the church down into the mud. It's different. You've got to be different. 
You've got to repent. Now look in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now we're looking at the subject of loose living. Now this was a proverb of this church. They were saying these, kind of like a buzzword around the church. Hey, all things are lawful for me. Hey, all things are lawful for me. But he says, you know what? That may be true, but they're not helpful. And you don't want to be brought under the power of anything. They were using the grace of God as a license to sin. Paul says in Galatians 5.13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty... Not only do not use liberty as an opportunity for your flesh, but through love serve one another. So don't allow these things to cause you to think, okay, I can just do whatever I want and I can sin. That's just bringing you under bondage once again. So not all things are helpful. I'm, what I'm allowed to do may not help me in my Christian life. And I don't want to be brought under the power of anything. What I'm allowed to do may put me back in bondage. For instance, smoking. Can I smoke and go to heaven? Yeah. Okay, I can smoke and go to heaven, but it's not helpful to me. Right? And it makes me addicted. Right? So, um, it might be for some drinking. Can I have a, a glass of wine? Can I have a beer? Sure I can. But... I don't want to become addicted to that. You know, if I think, well, I've got to have a, a glass or, or something just to unwind at night. Am I relying on that to kind of calm me down or I'm actually relying on God? I don't want to become addicted to these things. Gambling can be that way for some people. I remember a, a brother when we were ministering up in, in uh, the north. This brother, he'd just become a Christian. He came to me one day in tears because... He had a gambling addiction. You know, these gambling companies will give you money up front just to get you going. And then you get in debt, and then they give you a little bit more, and then pretty soon you're addicted to it. And he, and he got so far in debt, and his wife didn't know about it. And he was just hiding it. And so that can be a problem. I was thinking also about certain things that we see, videos, things on the internet, maybe movies that we're watching with sex scenes or certain innuendos and they can trigger things especially in men now can you look at those things and be a Christian it's a gray area isn't it yeah but they're not helpful and they can bring you under the power of these things because the moment you close your eyes you're starting to think about it and it becomes a problem And so he says, yeah, all things are lawful for us, but not all things are helpful, and you don't want to be brought under the power of anything. Susanna Wesley said to her sons, John and Charles, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things, whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. You know, I've often gone with this um, saying in my mind. Others may, other Christians may have this liberty. I cannot. Because I know that if I do that thing that other Christians seem to be able to do, it's going to cause me to be in bondage. It's not going to help me. And I have to withdraw from those things. So that was one of their sort of buzzwords. All things are lawful for me. But another one was, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. This is like Proverbs number two to them. They may have used this as justification for sexual immorality. Hey, it's just a biological function, just the way eating is. So if you have this urge to have sex, we'll just satisfy it. Now you remember in ancient Corinth, they had the temple of Aphrodite. They had 1,000 temple priestesses who used to descend into the city at nighttime And they would engage in the practice of um, prostitution with, with men in order to kind of worship the goddess Aphrodite. There were sailors and traveling businessmen and lots of wealth in that city. 
And so it was a sex saturated culture, and sex was just common, it was just normal. And so the new believers in Corinth brought this mentality into their Christian lives. And they just thought, well, this is what everybody does. There's no problem to it. Reading recently some of the comments of the new atheists, and they, they say things like, it's so petty that the God of the Bible would care who we sleep with. You know, I just don't get it. Why does he even care? Well, here's why. Look in the end of verse 13. He says, now the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Sexual immorality is the word pornea. And it means any sex act outside biblical marriage. And that includes premarital sex, extramarital sex, incest, homosexuality, bestiality. In fact, Jesus even said... You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you even look at a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. Pornography. Remember years ago, before I was a Christian, I was playing tennis in Europe and I was traveling around and I went to Amsterdam to the red light district. And I saw things there that affect me to this day. That God has had to, to take my mind and transform my thinking through the washing of the Bible. I really, when I became a Christian, I struggled so much. And I had to learn to memorize the Bible in order to get rid of those thoughts in my mind, those images that I saw in that time that I spent there. It, it really, really affected me. This is sexual immorality. Now, the way God has designed it is simply this. Genesis 2.24 a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. One man, one woman for a life. God made sex. Sex is not evil. Right? Some groups in Christianity they teach that, that the sin of Adam and Eve was that they were naked or that they had sex. That's not true at all. Sex is not evil, it's, it's wonderful, it's good. God made it. But God knows best how it should function for maximum blessing and maximum pleasure. Hebrews 13.4 says, The marriage bed is honorable among all and undefiled. So, husband and wife, in their marriage bed, God says, that's a blessing. I'm going to bless that. It's wonderful, God says. Proverbs 6.27 tells us this. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? You know, fire is really good when it's in the fireplace, but when you scoop it up into your lap, it's a problem. Ouch. It's burning. Same thing with sex. When it's in a marriage, what's wonderful, it's beautiful. What an expression of love. But when it's outside of the bonds of biblical marriage, it burns, it hurts. And so, again, I've failed in this area, and perhaps you've failed in this area. Maybe, maybe the enemy is sitting on your shoulder and saying, guilty sinner. If you're a Christian, God has wiped you clean of that. He's wiped you clean. And there's no more condemnation for you. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something else in this particular verse, though. It says... Now, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now, I realize that first part. Of, you know, we give our bodies to the Lord here. Lord, I'm going to yield myself to you. But it says, the Lord was made for your body. I like that. You know what this reminds me of is um, a, a great movie. If you've never seen it, it's called Chariots of Fire. One of my favorite movies. And in this movie, Eric Little, it's a true story about his running of the 1922 Olympics. He says to his sister, he says, Jenny, I believe God made me for a purpose. He was going to be a missionary. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. When I run, I feel the pleasure of God working through my life. I like that. I think that about things that I do with my sports or with when I'm 
fixing the car or when I'm just walking or whatever. When I do these things, I feel the pleasure of God upon my life. You know, as you go in your life, God, God is, he's in your body. As a Christian, he lives inside of you. He's, you're his hands, his feet. You ever wonder why when Jesus, in John 16, he says, it's better for me that I go away. You ever wonder about that? It's better for me that I go to heaven. Huh? It's better for you that you're right here. Better for us that you're right here. No, because if he goes to heaven, he'll send the Holy Spirit and then he'll inhabit millions of bodies rather than just the one that he had then. He's living in millions of people now. I love that. Look in, the, uh, in verse 14. And God both, both raised up the Lord and will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. This is why so many people today are in pieces. Why their lives are so shattered. Because of sexual immorality in this way. And let me explain. When it tells us in Genesis 2.24 that a man shall be joined to his wife, cleave to her, and the two shall become one flesh. It literally means that they'll be glued together. And so, for a person to go from one sexual partner to another sexual partner to another sexual partner, you cannot separate that without a tear. They're glued together. Now, you try to separate two pieces of paper that have been glued together. It doesn't come apart too easily, does it? There's a tearing that takes place. And that's why many, many people are shattered. And that's why many, many relationships fail. It's because they're bringing this shattered life to another individual and they're saying, you've got to fix it. And the other person can't. But there's one person who can and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You can bring the shattered uh, mass of stuff from your past to Him and He will heal you and He'll put you back together and make you whole once again. That's what Jesus does. He's an expert in it. Look at verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now this is speaking of a complete intimacy with Jesus Christ. He says, flee sexual immorality. Flee sexual immorality. Do you remember Joseph with Potiphar's wife? Joseph was handsome and, he, and Potiphar made him the ruler over all of his household. And because he was handsome, strong looking, Potiphar's wife started looking at him and tempting him and saying, come and lie with me, come and sleep with me. And Joseph would not do it. And then one day when they were alone in the house, she grabbed hold of his cloak and said, come and sleep with me. And he ran and left the cloak there in her hand. He ran naked. He streaked for Jesus just to get out of there. He fleed sexual immorality. For the sake of God. So, Paul says to the Corinthians, flee. Don't try to talk it through. Don't wait for the temptation to fade. Don't try to save your reputation. He says, just get out of there. Get out of that situation as fast as you possibly can. You need sometimes to flee from people. You need sometimes to flee that room where you are. That dark place. You need sometimes to get up and flee from the computer screen. Just get away from it. You need sometimes to flee from a situation where you feel tempted sexually. Samson did not do that. One after one, another of the temptations that Delilah was giving him, he just let himself be be right there and it caused this great man of God to be shattered to pieces it's been said that sin will take you farther than you want to go keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay there's no such thing as like this quick fling in the Christian life or in any life it's going to cost he says get, get away from it flee from it Notice what else he says. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. 
But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. This is a very difficult passage. What I think what he means is in a comparative sense. You know, God designed sex to be such an intimate expression of love and one's total being that sexual sin is really unique among all other sins. And it affects a person physically, mentally, emotionally, and physically more than any other sin. Proverbs 6.32 says, The man who commits adultery is an utter fool, for he destroys himself. He's sinning against his own body. Greg Laurie said, I remember hearing an interview in which a man who had written some Christian books about the family confessed that he would boast to his friends, If I ever fall into sin, I guarantee it will not be adultery. Anything but. I love my wife so much that it would never happen to me. Guess what? He fell into the sin of adultery. The very thing he said he would never do is what he did. Then he concluded with this statement. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. That is so true. I remember my church history professor in Bible school. This man had planted a church and became a very successful church in the area. And little by little, he started to make subtle compromises in his life. And he ended up sleeping with the 18-year-old best friend of his daughter who was on the worship team. And this whole thing blew up. His wife divorced him. He was put out of the church. And he was actually working as a real estate agent in the same uh, building where my brother-in-law worked. And I went in and I saw him. And this man, who was a vibrant, physical... Uh, he, he looked good when, when he was teaching us. Physically, he just looked horrible. And just overweight, out of shape, just looked awful, down, depressed. And I, I said, how are you? And he said, I'm dealing with the consequences of sin. Man. And that was just a wake-up call to me. Wow. You know, this stuff does happen. And he says, flee sexual morality. Get away from that. Chuck Smith, many years ago, was called by a lady in his church whose husband had left her for another woman. And this wife was in tears and she said, Chuck, can you just go speak to him? Talk some sense into him. And Chuck was upset with this man. And he went over to this, where this man was living with this woman and he was really going to give it to him, you know. Tell him off. And he goes in and there they are living in this converted garage and he looks around, there's just rubbish everywhere and here's this woman, here's this man and he just thought in his, in his mind he's left this woman for a crust of bread. How sad. And he just began to cry right in the presence of this man. And he said, I, I came here to tell you something but I, I just can't, I'm sorry. And he just cried and left. And that man that day, left that woman and went back to his wife and his kids and got things right. And it was the tears of a man of God who brought him to his senses. He says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The word is naos, which means the holy of holies. It's where God dwells. He dwells in your heart. He says, you're not your own, but you've been bought at a price with the blood of Jesus Christ. That is how much he loves you, that he's willing to lay down his life for you. And so he says, now, because of that, I want you to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. He owns that. He owns your body. 
Years ago when Lisa and I were ministering in, in Hungary, we were in the city of Estergom and we met a girl who was very scantily dressed, really catching the eyes of the boys in town. And we, we witnessed to her in our group letter to Jesus. And she came that night to the Bible study and she was a new person. She was dressed differently. She covered up. Even though nobody said, hey, you need to dress differently. You need to cover that up. She did it because the Holy Spirit had come into her life and showed her, you know what? I need to glorify God with my body. And she just covered herself and lived for God. I remember a number of years ago in this very church, I was teaching in John chapter 4 about Jesus meeting the woman at the well. And you remember the story where um, she had had five husbands and the man that she was living with, she was not even married to. And I go through this whole teaching and Jesus, how Jesus saved her and everything. Before I got home, there was a couple that had come that were living together in sin. And they met me at my house. And before I even got to my house and they said, you know what? We need to get things right with God. We need to get married. They were glorifying God with their bodies. If you're struggling this morning with pornography, with adultery, with fornication, with homosexuality, whatever it may be, you need to get help. And I encourage you to get help here and get help now. But you need, you need the Lord. James 5.16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's something powerful about confessing your sins and trespasses to another brother or sister. We often think, yeah, God knows about it. But then the, the situation doesn't change and the sin keeps going on. But when we confess it to a brother or a sister and they pray for us, there's something that breaks. There's something that changes in that. And they can help us. Father, we thank you for this time in the Word. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you know everything that we do and every sin that we've ever committed and, and you're willing to forgive us. You don't want to hold these things against us, Lord. You died for every one of them. Lord, help us. Help us to glorify you with our bodies. Help us this day not to leave this place if we're struggling, but to come and to get help. So I want to pray for anyone here this morning, Lord, that you'd bring them forward for prayer. Bless them. And I pray that everybody here, Lord, would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that they would flee sexual immorality, that, that Lord, that they'd glorify you with their body and their spirit, which are yours. And so we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.